Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live on a Friday afternoon, relaxing ourselves here at Think Tech and talking to our old friend, uh, Kartiki Mishra, who lives in Varanasi, India, which is near, it's the northern part of India along the Ganges River. You've all seen pictures of it. And he joins us from time to time to talk about things that happen in, in Varanasi and in the northern part of India and in India and in the world. He's very worldly. He's a student at one of the universities uh, in Varanasi. Welcome back to the show, Kartiki. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you with us. Uh, I, I want to tell you a story before we go too far. You know, here in ThinkTech, we use Adobe products. You know Adobe? And our editing software is Adobe software. Well, uh, um, you know, some of the um, support centers for Adobe are in India. And they feature Indian support agents. I'm not sure where in India. So uh, if you call Adobe and you want technical support, uh, they will connect you with uh, people in the support center in India. Well, the uh, people in Adobe have been watching you and me. And the last time I called them, they had a whole bunch of people in the support center wanted to get on the phone and say hi, because they thought that ThinkTech has a great connection with India and with a fellow named Karnaki Mishra. So you are famous, Karnaki. They know you in Adobe, a global corporation. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I know Dolby. I think Dolby is in cinema also. Dolby Cinemas and Dolby uh, Soundtrack or something is in theater. We use that in movies for Dolby Studio. <laughs> they may be watching us now, you know. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to cover a few things with you just to take your temperature, take India's temperature and things that are going on. And India certainly is an active global player. And Mr. Modi is uh, very active indeed these days. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned to me when we spoke before was that he had had a, a visit with uh, Premier M Macron from France, President Macron yeah. from France. And, and that took place, what, in Varanasi? How about that? Can you talk about it? Uh, yes, I can talk about it. And it was one of the most brilliant visits we had in the last two years. In 2015, uh, Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, came up with the Prime Minister Modi to Varanasi, and then uh, Macron is coming to Varanasi, or I should say he came to Varanasi, and he stayed here for a day, I think. And it was like celebration throughout the cities when he was uh, visiting the city, cut out, posters, uh, welcome chants everywhere, uh, people holding flags of France and India, welcoming Prime Minister Modi and President Macron. So what do, people, what do people think of President Macron? I mean, after all, there was a big fight about uh, shall France go to the left or go to the right? Shall they become uh, repressive with regard to the, uh, immig uh, the migrants in Europe? Uh, um, or shall they uh, be more liberal with Macron? What do people in Varanasi, what do people in India, what do you think about Macron? I think Macron is liberal, and I personally believe that the liberal policies of Mr. Macron is quite good for India and for European Union also. And he said that, uh, that India should choose uh, France as the new doorstep for the European Union. And uh, France is the ninth largest investor, uh, foreign investor in India in terms of money. And India is 30th largest investor in France. So Mr. Macron was hoping more investments in uh, France and to increase that number from 30 to first or second, I think, in terms of investment from India to France. Ah. So, um, you know, what is, is, is Mr. Modi is creating these international relationships, isn't he? He's, he's very open. He's, he's outward. Uh, he's talking with uh, everyone. He's, he's uh, even Trump, I suppose. He's, he's talking with China. He's talking with Xi Jinping, and I want to discuss that with you. Uh, and he's talking with Europe. Uh, how do you see this? How does the average Indian see this as Mr. Modi's initiative to connect with the world? India is becoming a diplomatic power right now, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I think it is the success of Prime Minister Modi that in foreign front or in foreign policy, he's very successful and quite admired by the people of India. Not just uh, France, 
But every nation he visited is uh, youth coverage in India, media houses talking about it, and foreign relations are something which is very interesting from the point of view of India, I think. And uh, visit, uh, he visited US also, visited Donald Trump. Uh, he visited France also when in 2015, Trump was Hulan was president. And he visited many nations. So in foreign front, he is quite active and quite successful in India, and people admire him a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> um, Europe has changed, uh, of course. And uh, India is, is interested in that because it, it affects India directly or indirectly. And Europe has problems now with the migrants. It has problems with um, sort of a turning right. Uh, we saw how, how hard Angela Merkel had to work in order to uh, re retain her uh, majority in the, uh, in, the, in the German parliament. Um, and, and we see, uh, you know, changes in, in, in Europe that are a little bit troublesome. Uh, and I, I just wonder what, what you and what Indian people in general think of the trouble in Europe. Uh, does this give you concern? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a concern, migrant crisis in Europe. It was quite famous in India why people were moving away from uh, Iraq, Syria to Europe. And I know that. And Ailan Kurdi's photo was quite famous in India, the boy dying on the beach, a dead body on the beach. So people throw that crisis, migrant crisis, and it's quite clear that people want to help somehow or the other way. India is far away uh, from the Middle East, I should say. So they move to Europe, but there is a lot of sympathy for Syrian people from India and Iraqi oh. people from India. Sure. For fighting more than service. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, right now you're having a bit of a contention with Pakistan uh, over the Internet. I don't know if you've noticed that. I saw that when I looked up Google News on India. Uh, and Pakistan has built a wall around the, uh, about the Internet, which I, which I take it is not a good thing. Uh, and I wonder what, you know, what the average Indian thinks about the relationship of India and Pakistan especially in view of the fact that Pakistan has been blamed with uh, it being a harbor for terrorist activities. Um, I think uh, it's quite clear that India does not have a very good relation with Pakistan. We went on with three conventional wars in 48, in 1965, in 1971, and one major conflict in 1999. So we have three or four wars to Pakistan, so it can tell you a lot how much relations which we are having with Pakistan and uh, proxy wars are supported by Pakistan in Kashmir. We know that, that they harbor terrorism or cross-border terrorism and it is affecting Afghanistan also. Pakistan's terrorism is not just against India, it's just against all the people who are neighboring Pakistan and China somehow supports Pakistan. When you have said that uh, Pakistan is harboring terrorism and Pakistan should do more, China says that uh, uh, Pakistan has sacrificed a lot. U.S. should praise Pakistan. But the fact is Pakistan is not doing a lot against terrorism. Mm. Now, that's really too bad because it's, it's in a position geographically uh, to do a lot against terrorism given Central Asia. But you mentioned China, and I do want to have a discussion with you about China because, you know, people say in this country that it's not only that Xi Jinping wants to be president for life, but that this affects world opinion. It affects world opinion about uh, the emergence of dictators, uh, especially in a country that's a democratic country like India. And, and if I were in India, I would expect that people in India would not like to hear about dictatorships because you work so hard uh, to, you know, to preserve your democracy, to express your democracy, uh, one of the great democracies in the world. Um, so when he elects himself president for life uh, and emerges as a strong man and a dictator, uh, you know, reducing uh, human rights, reducing uh, civil rights all over the country in so many ways on a, a daily basis, that would give the average Indian some concern, does it? Yes, it is. Uh, because in India, there is no uh, qualification like that. You can stay president or prime minister for life if you are democratically elected by the people of India, no problem. But if you declare that you want to stay in power for life, that's a very big problem, I think. And it's quite, uh, I would say, communist in nature again, that China bullies or tries to say that uh, this is the area of influence of China. China is uh, building so much projects to help the nation. 
But I believe that China is trying to capture nations in debt trap by providing them a loan at 7% or 8% by providing Belt and Road Initiative, which we do not support in India. Mm. You know, it's, it strikes me you're in an interesting spot <clears throat> because you, you're, in, you know, just as a matter of your national character, uh, you're not inclined to support a dictator. Um, and uh, certainly Xi Jinping is emerging as just that. Uh, at the same time, you know, you have an interest in maintaining good relations with China. It's a very powerful country just, just uh, near your border. Um, and it's, uh, you know, involved in the uh, One Belt, One Road, uh, you know, uh, to initiative going from China to Europe. So you're there. You're there geographically. You're in the middle of things. Um, so, you know, you have a kind of a, a dilemma because uh, you want to remain democratic, but you also want to, you know, succeed in, in your own geographical uh, area. And then, of course, we have Mr. Trump, who, you know, who is unpredictable. Um, and so where, where do you fit? Where does that fit in terms of India's relationship with the U.S. Uh, as opposed to its relationship with China? Uh, I'm not saying you have to make a choice, but I'm saying that India must uh, figure out a, a way diplomatically to handle the challenges on both ends of that. Okay, uh, I had a two-part answer for that. Uh, one thing, China is one of the largest uh, trading partners with India. Around 80 billion U.S. dollars we trade. And uh, for U.S., I would say U.S. and India are having a quite different relationship uh, with uh, I would say with China. If we take three nations, US, China, and India, I think US and India can cooperate together because of democracy. They think similar. They uh, are promoters of liberty. And China is a bit of type dictator in this region, uh, trying to say that the South, uh, South China Sea is its area of influence and all the areas which in China is working is actually quite a big problem. In Djibouti, uh, China is making a military base. In Maldives, uh, China said to India that India should not interfere in Maldives crisis. There was an emergency or a problem in Maldives uh, regarding the current ruling government. And India is not interfering in that, but China says that India must not at any cost interfere in Maldives. And it also says that it does not want any other clash point with India in this uh, particular region. So what I, what I get is, uh, you know, China is very aggressive in its one belt, one road. It's not just economic. It's not just transportation. It's not just outreach. Uh, it, it includes military strategies and tactics and advances uh, and, and getting advantages. It's a military outreach uh, in many ways. And that includes um, uh, on your borders. Um, it should give you great concern to see that happen. It should great, give you great concern to see what, what's happening in the South China Seas. Um, so how does India deal with that? How does India maintain a relationship where it doesn't feel that China uh, is ready for an incursion on its borders? Uh, I think uh, India and China both know the fact that they can't live without each other. China can't replace India and India can't replace China. So it is a kind of relation which we have sweet points sometimes in climate, sometimes in issues which we can cooperate with China and on which Trump is having a different opinion. Uh, say, for example, uh, example by the Paris Climate Action and then trade, and uh, he moved away from that trade treaty. And that's all the things in which India and China are having similar uh, thoughts. But when it comes to the idea of uh, influence, China and India are quite different. India focuses on uh, soft core influence, through uh, diplomatic means, uh, through social or cultural means, China focuses on uh, economic uh, much more aggressive in a tradeful manner to influence the country's uh, culture uh, or I would say uh, politics. I would say in, in simple terms, mm -hmm. of the nation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, let's skip. Uh, let's take a, a short break, and we'll take one minute off if you don't mind, uh, Carnegie. We do that. And we'll come back in one minute. And when we come back, I want to ask you about how the North Korea, South Korea issue uh, affects your thinking and the thinking of the average Indian person uh, over what do you call it, security in Asia Pacific. We'll be right back uh, with Karnaki Mishra in Varanasi, India. 
Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance, not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Okay, we're back with Karthiki Mishra in Varanasi, India, and we're talking about how you know Indian people feel, how he feels about various things that are taking place in the world. Uh, you know, respecting, of course, the fact that India is a global nation more and more all the time. So one of the things that's happened here in Hawaii, if, uh, if I didn't mention it to you before, Karthiki, is that we had a false alarm and the local government, by mistake, uh, sent a message to everybody in the state of Hawaii telling them that there were ICBM missiles uh, en route to Hawaii and that everyone should take cover. And they said this was not a drill. It was just a mistake, but not a drill. So what happened is everybody took cover and worried and got all excited about it. And it, 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 and it, it got resolved, although there's a you know, political, political controversy about it now. Bottom line is, um, you know, people in Hawaii are afraid. And uh, I guess some of the people on the West Coast are afraid. And, um, and it shows you that we live in a time when nuclear attack is possible and considered by some, some leaders. So, so here we also have um, an unprecedented meeting between uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un to take place between April and May. Nobody's sure that it will take place or that it will be successful. But I wonder how closely you're following all this. I wonder how closely the average Indian person is following all this. I wonder what Mr. Modi has said you know, to, to the public. I wonder how people in India feel about the problem with North Korea. Can you talk about it? Uh, I, I can talk about it. Um, first of all, last time I said uh, that issues would be resolved between North Korea and um, America. Um, I was hopeful and this was happening and this will happen. I think President Trump will meet with Kim Jong-un. And again, I would say in India, uh, North Korea and India do have diplomatic ties, which are only limited to aid, medicine and food providing necessities which North Korea requires. And we are having diplomatic ties with North Korea just due to the fact that Pakistan and China also have ties with North Korea. And that's the sole reason in North Korea as a diplomatic partner. And I believe that diplomatic channels are always successful for handling tensions between the nations. And in India, we know that, Prince Modi knows that, that trade would be restricted to the necessities, to the medicines and food facilities, which is required by North Korea, nothing else would be provided to them. And uh, people are uh, thinking that this uh, meeting between uh, America and North Korea would ease down the tension between uh, these two nations. And uh, recently I knew that in uh, Olympics in South Korea, both the nations, North Korea and South Korea, played under a United flag as a United Korea. So these are all uh, things which I think are hopeful, and we should be hopeful that things will ease down between the nations of uh, all these this region, Pacific region. Yeah, well, that's that's good. Um, I didn't realize that you had. So you, as a, an Indian citizen, assuming you had the time and money, would you be interested in flying to North Korea and, and taking a walk around, being a tourist there? I think uh, we have our diplomatic relations with North Korea. If things ease down, if things are and tariffs are removed, if North Korea uh, stops uh, doing nuclear tests and missile tests, and there is a possibility that Indian tourists may go to North Korea. Uh, there is a possibility. We can't ignore that. 
Yeah, interesting. Well, I mean, I know some Americans who've been to North Korea, you know, multiple times and are sympathetic with the North Korean people, though not with the government. Uh, and I, I really wonder if this is, um, you know, um, a, a controversy that is exaggerated in some ways by the, the personal comments that have been made by President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. And I want to I want to turn attention, if I may, to uh, how the Indian people and how uh, Premier Modi uh, feel about um, about President Trump these days. I asked you that before, and I recall that your answer was not altogether negative. That you felt that he he had a certain uh, value to offer, and that being a strong leader was uh, beneficial, at least in the minds of some Indians. Uh, has anything happened uh, that would change? For example. Uh, he uh, has interposed uh, uh, tariffs, serious tar tariffs uh, on steel. I want to say it's, uh, mm, what, 25% uh, on steel and 10% on aluminum entering the United States. Uh, there's quite a controversy about whether those are, uh, you know, uh, appropriate tariffs and whether tariffs like that are appropriate these days. Some of our allies in Europe have uh, spoken out against it. Um, I don't know uh, w whether India is affected by it. Uh, I don't know how, how much uh, steel you're importing or exporting to the United States, or aluminum for that matter. But I wonder what people's reaction is toward barriers to trade that way. We, we've had um, you know, several moves by this administration uh, to, to limit trade agreements, to drop out of uh, you know, various uh, regional trade agreements. And I wonder how India feels uh, about trade and about the United States and about Trump these days. Okay. Uh, I think Trump wants to start a trade war with nations, and that's fruitful for the United States, I believe that. Uh, this tariff implementation can cause a serious trade issues with different allies of the United States itself. And in the, uh, Trump is focusing on India, that India is not reducing tariffs on American products in India. But the situation is not like that. Even if we reduce the tariffs in India on American products, they are still, uh, I should say, uh, uh, costly enough for a common Indian to purchase. If you want a Harley Davidson bike in India, it would be less. And that's a, quite a lot of amount of money in India. But I believe that uh, trade issues should be talked with uh, all the uh, leaders at a forum that how uh, issues of trade can be solved by the different leaders at a common point having a common tariff throughout the nation, which will be acceptable by each and every uh, member nation. Mm -hmm. We have G20, G8, but I think that's not fully functional. It should be much more inclusive, at least 40 to 50 nations should be included in that, and each nation should work. We have a World Trade Organization, but people generally do not listen to WTO, I know that. That's another issue, but I think trade issues can be solved. Well, yeah, and one other thing I want to ask you about, it's not unrelated, is, uh, is the, the question of immigration. Uh, in the United States, you know, we've had a pretty open policy. Myself, I just came back from a trip to Australia, and uh, in Australia, in the last few years, they have opened their immigration wide, wide open. And they have a very diverse population now. Uh, and it's only happened in relatively recent years. They have people from all over the world, certainly from uh, Asia, all over Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, India, uh, Bang Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, for that matter. Uh, it's quite amazing what kind of a diverse population Australia has achieved in only a few years. But in the United States, where we seem to be shutting, shutting it down, we're still interested in building that wall. Uh, you don't see it in the paper all the time, but the Trump administration is chasing immigrants all around and, and uh, trying to deport them on a regular basis in large numbers. And he has not yet uh, backed off or uh, otherwise uh, found a resolution for the, the dreamer uh, issue about those, those kids who uh, were who came to the United States with their parents were illegal but very young and have lived here all their lives. Um, and, and now uh, they're at risk of being sent away to countries they have never known. And um, uh, you know, I wonder, you know, and, and let me add one other thing, is that, is that there are a lot of Indians in this country and they do well. Um, they're, they're in school, they're do, in business, they are constructive members of the society. They're as American as anybody else um, and they're a success story. Um, on the other hand, there is, uh, there is white supremacy in this country. 
uh, and this white supremacy works against that. Um, and there have been uh, raci racist attacks, including one, uh, as I recall, a fatal attack somewhere in the South, which led a, an Indian doctor uh, who was practicing in a hospital in the South uh, to pick up sticks to leave the country with his wife and family, although he was a successful doctor, uh, and, and take off because he didn't feel the United States was, was a friendly nation to him anymore. So I wonder how Indians feel about this turn of events over the past year and um, you know, uh, w whether it changes uh, the perception of the average Indian uh, about, about the United States. Okay. Uh, I think that a lot of Indians are working in the United States. Everyone is working. So it can be a very big concerning issue if the United States restricts the policies regarding immigration. But one thing which President Trump is doing is that he is working against illegal immigrants who have criminal records, I think. And that's the corrective action for the people of the United States and for their safety, so I can praise that. But from a point of view of an Indian, that's the issue with, in which I think Indians would be concerned due to the jobs we are doing in the United States and people are traveling to the United States for some or the other reason. And uh, I think that illegal immigrants having criminal records should be tried and action should be taken. But, but when we are talking about uh, people who are coming uh, through direct routes, through legal routes to the United States, should be uh, taken in jobs, should be taken into uh, different areas in which they are working and should be limited. But whenever a, a such kind of thing regarding Trump's policy come in Indian newspaper that uh, Trump is taking measures against uh, immigrants, so there is a lot of concern about Indians, uh, what will happen to them. So the kind of tension is there, but we know that uh, legal people who are traveling from here and there to different nations would not be harmed. Yeah. You do realize that to the extent that this administration says that it is um, that immigrants are largely criminals, um, drug traffickers, um, and other you know uh, uh, un, 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 unattractive um, members of society, um, that a lot of people disagree with his statements in that regard. And there's a question as to whether his statements in that regard are true. Um, and that really what, what, what most people feel, most people I know feel, uh, is that he is uh, excluding races and cultures and re reducing diversity as fast as he can, uh, which of course is not a good thing for the economics or, or for the principles on which this country was founded. Um, does, does the average Indian recognize that? I think Trump is racist to an extent. We recognize that fact, that some of his other policies are targeting towards the racist people and I think that last time when the Oscars were held, all the people, black, black Americans, were wearing black dress, and a kind of protest was there in Oscars, and he commented on that also. And so there, we know that a bit racist touch is there in, to Donald Trump, and we know that. Uh, racism is uh, having a very deep, deep root history in the United States. I know about it. Uh, people of India may not, because uh, history of the United States is not that much taught in India, but. Uh, I know the history that uh, all the history of United States, how United States was found, natives, natives first when Europeans came, uh, they take actions against the native people of United States, then again uh, African people were brought at place to United States. So there is a very long history of racism, so we can't blame President Trump for whatever happening is in United States right now. So it has some historical and cultural reasons due to which he takes such actions. Mm. Well, you know, I, I mentioned before, uh, Carnegie, that uh, every time I talk to you, you uh, seem to be more sophisticated and you look better on our connection. Uh, sometimes we have interruptions in our connection, but mostly, uh, you know, these shows are better and better. And I, and I wonder if uh, you have any thoughts about how uh, participating in a show like this on Think Tech here in Hawaii in the United States has affected your way of thinking, your way of looking at things, your way of reading the newspaper. Have you had... Uh, you know, any personal experience involving that? Yeah, I think a uh, boost of confidence, I would say, uh, shows like this on um, international arena, I would say. It is an international uh, show, I would say. Uh, people of Hawaii are listening to me through uh, radio, through YouTube. So it, it is quite boosting, uh, confidence boosting, and I, I know that. Uh, I can get the point of view of an average American, I think, 
regarding uh, what happening in, what is happening in, in US. So it is things I think quite interesting for me and quite interesting for people of Hawaii also. I'm glad we met, Karnaki. I look forward to doing this with you again in a few weeks and to finding out more about the dynamic between our two countries and more about India, because I really want to know and a lot of people want to know. And I also want to make sure that Adobe Systems is listening to us too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Karnaki Mishra in Varanasi, India. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>